Hello, good morning everyone. I'm Joe. I'm uh, working in European Digital Rights and uh, the first topic, as was said, is about big data, um, which is a subject that um, worries me a lot. Uh, it's, it's not just a term that means a lot of data. It's not, it's not lots of data, it's pregnant data. It's data that gives rise to new data without anybody necessarily being aware of it. And uh, with the uh, data, retention, data Protection Directive and regulation going through, um, and with uh, the beginnings of discussions about a new Data Retention Directive, where uh, there have already been calls for a more horizontal approach to the types of data uh, that should be stored, this issue is, I think, one of the biggest challenges facing our democracies and uh, our individual identities. So we've got three excellent uh, panelists that can cover a good introduction to, to the subject. Um, Anna Fielder is, um, is a, a, a national and European treasure. <laughs> That's not um, a way to start. <laughs> both, both for TACD, uh, Privacy International, and, uh, and EDRI. She's going to give a broad introduction to the, uh, to the issues at stake and what big data actually means. Uh, we have uh, and Andreas, uh, uh, sorry, Sebastian Schwed. Schweda, who is uh, in the Human Rights uh, in the Digital Age Coordination Group for Amnesty International, is going to give an analysis from his perspective of the issue and also a brief introduction to their uh, strategy on the subject. And then uh, we have Vera Franz uh, from the Open Society Foundations, who's going to look at the, the actions that are already underway on an, on an international level uh, in this subject because there, there are a lot of individual projects, a lot of good work being done um, uh, around Europe and, and internationally. And hopefully um, after our introductory sessions, um, speeches, we've got a better idea of what, uh, what is going on, why it's significant, who's doing what and, uh, and what to do next in the, um, in the current uh, framework in the current plan for legislation. So I'm going to shut up and I'm going to pass on to Anna. Thank you. Um, it's very nice to be here and I feel a bit like being at school with, you know, the slightly worn wooden desk and all you sitting in a row. Um, what, what I was going to say is I'm not a huge expert on big data and probably a lot of you know more about it than I do. And, um, I've been asked to give a sort of overview and also look at the legal issues a little bit, but please, you know, I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Um, just to start, and incidentally, big data there, uh, I'm a big fan of Star Trek, so that is not an accidental picture, and data was one of my favourite characters, but he didn't know what to become, so there you are. Um, definitions. Do you all are you all very familiar with what big data is? Because it's a term banded everywhere. There's an official definition which says is a term used to describe the application of analytical techniques to search, aggregate, and cross-reference large data sets in order to develop intelligence and insights. Um, that's the official definition. Um, and these data sets can be any um, publicly available information that is aggregated like meteorological data or census data um, or it can be exhaust data, in other words all the likes on Facebook and all the sort of credit card purchases and, and so on so it can be anything and what I'm going to concentrate here obviously is on personal information because that's what we're talking about. Um, there's four key facts about um, big data. The first one is that it does not equal truth and it doesn't provo provide causal links. 
Um, just to give you a story as an example, and it's from 1936, um, there was a big election in the US between Roosevelt and a, and a Republican guy called Landon, you've probably heard this case <coughs> history before, and there was a well-known um, magazine that decided to do a really good prediction, and so they sent uh, uh, surveys to 10 million Americans to ask them which way they are going to vote, and they received back two and a half million responses, which was a huge sample. And they said Landon's going to win by a margin of 55 percent, and in reality, Roosevelt had a landslide victory. Um, and why did this happen? Is because, and, and at the same time, there was a much smaller survey by a guy called Gallup. Um, uh, you all must have heard about Gallup surveys now, uh, who did a much smaller survey but actually predicted the result much more accurately. And the reason for that was that those 10 million people were gotten out of car licensing data and telephone data, so, so the sample omitted a huge swathe of Americans that didn't own cars and didn't have telephones and they also voted and that I think that's the first lesson to to learn about big data uh, it's not the truth uh, it's not just by having a huge sample uh, you're not actually going to find the reality because you never know what the bias is and uh, whom you are meeting and if you were trained in research and surveys at all, that's a simple truth that has been ignored in all this hype about big data. Um, the second truth is that the analysis is not necessarily neutral because the parameters are put in by, by human beings. Um, and, and so the result is that you can have a lot of discrimination um, which can be on the basis of race, gender, income and so on. And there are examples of that. I mean, even uh, the, the White House did a, did a report by John Podesta on, on big data. And they have examples there showing that if you have a, a black person's name, like Germain in the search results, uh, you are going to get ads that have the word arrest much more in them than if you're going to have a, a, a white guy's name like Jeffrey or um, and there are many many examples um, I mean I think Lira will talk about the target case and so on um, so the the problem with the the discrimination issue is that there's not enough that there, there's not enough research on it research is very difficult and so you get a lot of stories about it. Um, actually, that's one thing that needs to happen much more, is to do some more concerted research on what actually happens in reality. And Joe was telling me today about this Cambridge study that, you know, maybe you can talk about it later. Um, so the third truth is big data analysis necessarily excludes those segments of the population that produce less data than others. Um, and usually those are the less empowered and the vulnerable. And this is particularly true in, in developing countries. Um, you know, I'm Privacy International, we are global. We do a lot of work in developing countries. Um, and uh, absurdly, a lot of counter-arguments when you, <coughs> when you say this is, oh, well, that's all very well, let's collect more data about them rather than address it in a much more sort of rational way. Um, so finally, the unresolved challenges of big data resolve around the overarching issues of control, purpose, of use and ethics. Um, those are the sort of most important things we, we, we have to talk about and I, I also um, you need to remember that when we talk about this vast data collection, uh, we're, not, we're not just talking about 
data that people have given willingly to do a transaction or on Facebook or whatever, a lot of it is what, what, what the Financial Times has called exhaust data. In other words, traces that we leave all live around the internet in our daily lives and they are increasingly mined and collected and associated um, to give a sort of detailed picture about us that even we didn't know we had. Um, so, what does that mean in terms of action? Because I've got seven minutes, so I need to carry. Um, you know, the big picture is that we need to open this up to public scrutiny. We need stronger privacy laws to control our own data. We need to open us up the algorithm. I haven't talked about algorithm, but you know, you all know what it is, so I'm not going to and see what they do and we need to ensure that these intelligent programs do not create even bigger problems in society including through discrimination and exclusion and and here are some sort of um, big picture uh, way forward ideas and I'm going to leave the EU uh, legislation in the last two points and talk first about <coughs> two more overarching issues which are connected with the fact that as I said a lot of this data is exhaust data you haven't given consent to have it you haven't had a contract about it you don't even know it exists out there because it's based on your web searches um, so what does that mean um, the, there's two uh, authors that uh, have published a book one of them is a researcher for Microsoft, surprisingly, um, Crawford and Schultz, and they proposed a new framework called Data Due Process. Um, and it's been advanced as one way to bring accountability to big data analytics. Uh, those who have had decisions made about them on the basis of big data <coughs> analysis would have the right to know how that ana uh, analytics was carried out. So basically what they're saying is that you have to treat this as a, as a, ca uh, as a court case. You know, uh, if you are judged in a court of law by a jury, you have the right to representation and the right to argue uh, what these authors argue. The same should happen about big data. You have the right to come back. And that's particularly true when you've been accused of being a terrorist on the basis of uh, automated um, analytics rather than proper uh, lawful uh, warranted investigations. Um, and um, so, so the other sort of big issues is that the laws that protect individuals' personal information uh, must apply to big data systems too um, and this is you know what we said in our privacy international policy blog as organizations accumulate more information they will be held to account how they collected the information how they put this information to use and how individuals are affected by the use of the information and whether individuals were granted the opportunity to engage with a system. So, so that brings me to the European legislation and the regulation, and I know Joe's been waiting for that. Um, I mean, basically, if you think about it, there are many articles, both in the current Data Protection Directive, which is applied in all member states, uh, but in, in, the, in the draft regulation as well, that, that, that have to be applied to, to big data. I mean, first of all, the, the two principles of data minimization uh, kept no longer than necessary, so the temporary, and the purpose of processing, that it shouldn't be used for a different purpose from that to which it was collected without either the explicit per permission of the, of the person who, uh, uh, whose data it is, 
or by other contractual means and so on. So there's already quite a lot of mechanisms in the, in the current legislation to deal with it. Uh, another very important point in the current legislation is that there's this provision in Article 12, as, as geeks remember, um, that, that says that uh, people have the right to know, uh, it's, it's what we call show me the algorithm. People have uh, the right to go to the uh, data controller and, and ask how the decision was made, what the formula is. Um, so so those, those things are in place there now. Uh, they're not being enforced. Nobody knows that these things happen. So, you know, it's useful to have them on, on paper, but the key question is how are you going to apply them? We talk about the new regulation, which is now in draft format. We have a much more, in my view, disastrous situation. Um, I mean, we still have those principles, we have the right to object, which is great, uh, but there are two articles. Uh, number 20 and 21. Number 20 talks about profiling uh, and automated decisions, meaning, you know, there's no human intervention. You have these huge computer systems that analyze and profile you and then a decision is made. And that was started by credit reference agencies quite a long time ago uh, in the 70s to assess whether you are credit worthy or not. Um, well, in the, in the current draft of the regulation, Article 20 was improved marginally by the Parliament and uh, Article 21 was the one that had exceptions, meaning when you don't need to apply this rule. And that was so broad that uh, in the original draft that it meant any government of any hue could actually make a law so-called in the public interest that completely negated this. So it included financial decision, health decisions, uh, general welfare of the population, I think, everything. Um, again, the Parliament improved this and deleted Article 20 from that exclusion. And now it's cropped up back into the um, Council of Ministers version, uh, which means when they start negotiating between the three of them to finalise the regulation, you are going to have the Commission and all the member states uh, completely undermining um, what I would consider data subject rights and the Parliament arguing against them, and the result is completely unknown. But from my perspective, that means that the red line that Vivian Redding said, the new regulation will not cross, i.e. it will not be worse than the current legislation, has already been crossed. So what are we going to do about it? That's it. So, uh, if I would start with the international um, uh, developments that have been going on after um, the first uh, Snowden revelations uh, came out. Um, I think the most encouraging signals uh, that we, we can see uh, is or are the initiatives uh, within the, the Human Rights Council that have been um, underway uh, for quite some time now. Um, there has been a, uh, a resolution adopted uh, that has been adopted in, in December of 2013, uh, sponsored by Brazil and Germany, um, on the right to privacy in the digital age. And um, that was followed by uh, a report um, drawn up by uh, the uh, United Nations Human Rights uh, um, uh, Commissioner. Um, Navi Pillai, um, and she, um, what she basically uh, said was um, there is a need for more transparency um, on what uh, states do uh, in terms of surveillance. Um, there's also a need for, for a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, engagement um, 
so uh, that's that's something that that has been um, uh, ongoing for for a while in the uh, internet governance uh, uh, processes, and uh, she she called for more um, uh, oversight. Um, uh, independent oversight mechanism uh, for state surveillance, um, but there was a need to, uh, to adapt national law uh, to, to um, what uh, international uh, provisions like, um, uh, for example, the Article uh, 17 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, say. Um, so Article 17 is the right to, uh, to privacy. Um, and uh, that citizens need to have an effective remedy of, uh, when uh, they have been when, um, when they have been under surveillance. Um, these uh, facts or these uh, these claims have been uh, taken up by uh, a further resolution that, um, that has been adopted uh, at the end of 2014, um, and. Uh, they added that they might consider establishing a special procedure. Um, uh, the United Nations special procedure is, uh, is usually a special rapporteur, um, like we have in, uh, on, on uh, freedom of expression um, or on uh, human rights, um, on the protection of human rights while countering terrorism. Um, and they have published reports on, on uh, this issue and state surveillance as well. Um, and so. Uh, uh, there might um, be a need, um, that was uh, the argument, there might be a need for a special rapporteur on the right to privacy. Um, and this rapporteur might be um, established um, in the next uh, Human Rights Council session. So um, that would be in, in March um, this year. Um, and Amnesty's uh, Position is, is very supportive of this uh, proposal, and we would we would like uh, to have this uh, special rapporteur um, uh, as soon as possible because um, uh, there is an, an urgent need, as we see that, uh, for for more more research on on uh, state surveillance, more transparency, more accountability, and uh, such a rapporteur could uh, uh, definitely. Uh, um, uh, have some value to this. Um, on the other hand, there have been uh, encouraging results uh, from the uh, Net Mundial uh, Summit uh, last year uh, in, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil. Um, uh, that's, uh, that conference ha had been, uh, had been uh, carried out by, by the Brazilian uh, government. Uh, and, oh, with uh, with this um, so-called multi-stakeholder community in, uh, in internet governance, and um, uh, it was encouraging in, in uh, terms of human rights because uh, for the first time there was a, a broad um, a broad consensus on on uh, some rough rough guidelines uh, um, on how human rights in the digital age uh, in an online world should be uh, designed. Um, the Net Mondial Outcome document uh, um, touched this uh, in a superficial way uh, still, but I think um, um, it's, it's a good start. Um, and so Amnesty will remain involved in, in the internet governance debate. Um, uh, and uh, try to extend human rights obligations on the internet. We will uh, try to um, focus on that in the in the next few years as well. Um, and uh, we encourage, of course, uh, the developments that happen going there for uh, a couple of years uh, already, like uh, the um, Internet Rights and Principles Coalition um, and their charter on, on uh, human rights and principles on the internet. And, and of course, uh, also the uh, necessary proportionate principles on, on surveillance. Um, so, um, yeah, and, if, uh, and, and to, um, let me make uh, two further points on, on the international um, uh, <coughs> level. Um, I think there is an, uh, an urgent need for um, 
for uh, for the U.S. to accept that uh, the uh, human rights uh, um, instruments uh, that exist um, and uh, the international covenant and civil and political rights is, is one of those. Um, that these uh, international uh, human rights uh, mechanisms apply um, not only on their own uh, soil but also um, extraterritorially. <coughs> um, and I think that, that there's an urgent need, um, like in particular in an online world where um, you can uh, exercise uh, power even uh, beyond your own borders. And on the, on, on the other hand, I, I think there's a need to, uh, to um, uh, to uh, uh, respect the uh, definition of national security that has been uh, taken as a as a justification for um, for the interference with the right to privacy, um, uh, the definition given uh, by the Johannesburg Principles, um, uh, which I think is is quite clear, um, but has been uh, has not been taken into account when. Uh, States resort to this uh, to this exception. Um, I think I'll um, I'll, uh, I'll do some uh, some brief overview just uh, over the EU and national level. At EU level, um, there's there are some uh, new developments um, that we will take into account, but uh, haven't uh, as yet. Um, uh, there is a legal opinion of the European Parliament, um, uh, of the European Parliament's legal service, on the consequences of the data retention judgment. Um, and uh, I think the most interesting fact is that uh, they are of the opinion that this uh, judgment uh, also applies to other kinds of blanket surveillance, like uh, the, the PNR um, agreement, uh, agreements, um, the uh, terrorist finance tracking uh, program, also known as uh, SWIFT agreement and the Smart Borders Package. So um, I think we can build on that. Um, at the same time, uh, there, is, uh, there are discussions about uh, the um, so-called umbrella agreement um, between the U US and the EU uh, on data protection. Um, this is a kind of a framework uh, a convention on how uh, personal data um, of citizens um, that the EU and the US should be protected, and what uh, kinds of, uh, um, yeah, um, what kind of uh, judicial redress uh, um, possibilities they uh, they have, and I think this is the most important uh, point that's still under discussion: um, uh, the judicial redress mechanisms uh, for EU citizens um, for data processed in in the US. Um, the, the text of this umbrella agreement has already um, been uh, agreed on. 95% um, have been negotiated um, already in 2014, but um, this uh, judicial redress uh, um, mechanisms are still uh, under discussion. Um, on the EU uh, part, I think Amnesty hasn't uh, affirms, uh, a firm opinion yet, but um, we will uh, uh, probably seek also to, to um, um, get a clearer definition of what national security means at uh, EU level, because it's been taken as, an, uh, as, an, um, as a justification to uh, exclude uh, um, surveillance state surveillance uh, uh, from the uh, data protection regime in, in the EU. <coughs> um, and uh, I think we need clarity on uh, what is covered by the EU competence in data protection and what is not. Um, and in this regard, I think the, the legal opinion of the uh, European Parliament's legal service is very, very um, uh, helpful as well. Well, thank you also very much to the organizers for the invitation and um, opportunity to spend this day with you before the uh, big event. Um, I want to, as Joe said, just briefly give an overview of what I'm seeing that is happening on big data, especially from a civil society perspective. Uh, starting with this um, uh, civil rights principles for, era, for the era of big data. 
So this is actually an initiative by United, uh, NGOs based in the United States. And just the interesting thing to note about this that it's really um, signatories are, if you scroll down a little bit, you can see the signatories. It's really a mix of uh, what we call digitalites or tech policy NGOs and uh, traditional civil rights groups, so uh, focused on racial discrimination, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, that's quite interesting in the principles. If you would scroll back up, I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Keeps um, busy. Really focused on, I think, some of the issues that Anna has been pointing out, which is, you know, sort of uh, towards the end, the sort of regaining control and ownership of data and then transparency of profiles and algorithms. Um, so this is something that is happening across the pond. Uh, and so looking to Europe, and of course these are only principles, you know, and sort of, I think they serve mainly the purpose of bringing uh, NGOs together and, you know, creating sort of a coalition around this. Uh, and of course then a lot of follow-up work will need to be to move these principles uh, forward and make them sort of uh, enforceable, and that will be a major challenge, especially in the United States. Um, I want to look a little bit at what I see happening in Europe, and um, I think because of the legal tradition and framework, there is probably a very uh, unique opportunity in Europe to sort of intervene in the big data space. Uh, the sort of data protection regulation has already been mentioned, and so th uh, um, that will be sort of, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that more. Um, and also I think uh, some of the um, NGOs, some entry members have started working on big data in some way. So I know Panopticon has done something on profiling um, of unemployed people. I know Bits of Freedom has done a bit of it. So there is, uh, you know, some, some momentum building. And then of course there is the major campaign around the data protection regulation on, on uh, profile and algorithm transparency. Now, what um, what do you, I, I have sort of want to talk a little bit about what I think from a public interest perspective, civil society perspective, what our sort of responses could be. And it's mainly, I think, uh, two things and now probably more, but I'll just talk a little bit about those. Once I think is creating an evidence base for the abuse that's happening. Uh, there are a couple of high-profile cases where there is, you know, abuse of big data in the sense of discrimination, etc. Uh, you are, I'm sure, familiar all with those high-profile <laughs> cases. To mention a few, it's the, of course, NSA metadata program. There is the Target case, uh, which is, uh, Anna referenced it this before, but it's basically a pregnancy prediction case. So where basically a supermarket um, called Target uh, emailed, uh, predicted that a woman would be pregnant based on her shopping behavior and sent you know, a note to the family or, and the father opened the letter before the daughter and that's the way how he found out that his daughter was actually pregnant. Um, then the very public Facebook um, experiment debacle this summer around, you know, uh, experimenting with moods by manipulating the news feed. So these are a couple of high-profile examples of what I would consider abuse of uh, data in this, in this environment of analytics. But I think a lot is actually happening in the dark. And I think uh, our responsibility is really to sort of shine the light on what's currently happening in the dark. And one... Um, couple of ideas. I think one issue is really the data broker industry, which is pretty much operating in the dark. Uh, the FTC put out a report, I think in April 2014, that's worth reading. There's some stuff in there. And then I think a Tactical Technology Collective actually at the Chaos Computer Club uh, published a project called Tractography which is basically exposing the data flows when you read certain news sites. <coughs> so anyhow, I think there is need to, for all of us to much more uh, sort of put pressure on exposing actually the data flows and building of profiles that's happening. And uh, just a, so a small sort of um, announcement as well that uh, we are actually launching a call for proposals 
end of January as Open Society Foundations focused on Europe and the Global South. And the call for proposals will really invite proposals um, that will document abuse cases. And we envisage uh, those applications to come from um, NGOs that work together on these documentations with academics. So we'd like to see collaborations across, you know, between NGOs and academics. And I want to mention it here because I know um, partly this event is here to foster more collaboration between NGOs and academics. Uh, anyhow, more details will be published soon, but again, this is an effort to also enable all of us to, uh, you know, document the abuse, which I think is always the first step when we want to sort of solve a problem. And then, um, secondly, that's my second point, in terms of response, of what I see, um, I think we, um, we need to sort of really sort of try and push back in a sort of bigger public way. I think there are lots of disparate efforts here and there, and everybody's starting to get their head around. But really, for me, uh, one potential approach, and I'm sure there are many others, is to basically reframe data protection and privacy as a um, sovereignty in data campaign. So what is, you know, what we're basically losing is control over our data. That's what's happening, especially in the big data environment. And so reclaiming control is actually what we need to sort of set out to do. And um, I first heard uh, Nakuru Turinet speak about, you know, sovereignty in data and sort of that could be a frame to sort of bring some of these efforts um, together. I'm sure there are many other frames, but that's one. Um, and there are basically a couple of things that I think would fall under such an effort. Um, one is enforcing, uh, you know, existing law, because we have a data protection law. And again, I, I know about Panopticon who is using existing data protection law and um, anti-discrimination law in Poland to sort of uh, challenge some of these abuses, so there's a lot of work to do there. But then, of course, we want to sort of upgrade the data protection law to deal with um, the big data environment, and that's uh, going back to the data protection regulation and really these specific articles that have already been mentioned, uh, in particular the right to profile transparency, but also <coughs> show me the algorithm. And as far as I'm concerned, it's really unique in the world. Nowhere else in a sort of draft law are these provisions or similar provisions currently being proposed. So I think there is really a big responsibility in this community to try and strengthen these uh, provisions because it would give us a little bit of, you know, power over what's happening. And then, of course, work with civil society in other parts of the world, including Brazil, where they have just published a draft data protection law on equally you know, um, making sure uh, civil society there is able to enshrine these provisions in, in those laws. The second one, a big one, is the, the transparency uh, of algorithms. I think that potentially needs even a separate, its own sort of set of regulations, but um, anyhow, that is, I leave it there, that's a really complicated <laughs> issue. And lastly, and that's my sort of last point here, is, um, the fact that, um, again, this idea of reclaiming back the uh, data, there are a couple of uh, ideas out there. One is, maybe you have seen the recent article by Evgeny Morozov on the data commons, which basically says that um, what we're currently faced with is really a data-centric capitalism. So where, uh, the, and I'm just quoting here, the central feature of this data-centric capitalism is the ability to capture behavior, clicks, locations, etc., uh, in real time and store for the future to create these profiles. And he says, importantly, that of course, as a from a community perspective, we do not have access to this data, so we cannot use it from our, you know, for our own purposes. 